College in the Paul B. Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics. I wish to welcome you to this evening's address. I'm Corwin Smith, the Executive Director of the Paul Henry Institute. The Paul Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics was created in 1997 to continue the work of integrating Christian faith and politics, an effort that was clearly evident in the life and work of educator and public servant Paul Henry. One of the activities of the Institute is its annual Paul Henry Lecture, and tonight marks the fifth such lecture. We thank you for your interest in tonight's lecture and for your presence here. We trust that you will find the evening to be a stimulating and an enjoyable time together. For those of you who may wish to learn more about the Henry Institute and its efforts, be informed about forthcoming speakers and other activities, there are several notebooks placed on a table in the back of this auditorium uh, where you can let us know by signing up to receive such information. Uh, we're pleased this evening to have a variety of public servants in attendance, uh, mayors, judges, legislators, and we wish to welcome and acknowledge your presence. Uh, last year when I did this, I couldn't see uh, the people in the audience very well, and I overlooked one or two people, and so this uh, even I'm going to ask that uh, those of you that are currently serving in public office, whether it's elected or appointed, if you would stand section by section and just uh, introduce your name and the position you hold, and then if the audience will hold its applause to the end, uh, we would like to at least acknowledge your presence and welcome you here. So is there anybody in the south section here who... Uh, serves in public office, and if so, would you stand up and identify yourself? Okay, what else? How about in the middle section here? Anybody who serves in public office? Yes, go ahead. Paul Sullivan, King County Circuit Judge. Okay, thank you, Paul. And anybody else in the middle section here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Colonel, is anybody on this section here? Sorry. Okay. I'm Rick Vance from uh, Calvin Graduate. I served with Paul in the Michigan House for some time, and I'm currently the Chief Judge of the Michigan Court of Appeals. And after hiring him into the law business, I'm John Loki, and I'm the mayor of <laughs> Well, we, we welcome your presence here, and thank you for coming. We also want to acknowledge the presence of Karen Henry Stokes and her husband, Jim. And would you stand and also receive our appreciation. Before uh, we introduce tonight's guest speaker, would you please join with me in a word of prayer. Our gracious and sovereign God, we gather here this evening seeking to be faithful servants in your kingdom work. We thank you for your faithfulness to us and for the mercy you have shown us. We acknowledge your sovereignty over all realms of life, including the political realm. We ask for your leading and direction as well as insight and discernment as we endeavor to fulfill our public responsibilities. We thank you for the life of Paul Henry, for his Christian convictions, his passion for justice. And we're grateful, too, for the work and witness of our speaker, Paul Hilligans. And we thank you that their records of public service testify to the fact that Christians in political life can be principled, yet effective public servants. As you have instructed us, we pray for those who are entrusted to rule over us. We pray for their health and safety. We pray that they may have energy and vision in addressing the problems that confront us as a people. And we pray that you will pro provide them with discernment and wisdom as they confront the many complex and contentious issues that are brought before them. And we ask that they will be able to balance rightfully and skillfully the demands of their principles and convictions with the need to find compromises that will enable solutions to be achieved. Bless us all to your service. Enable us, we pray, to be thoughtful and engaged citizens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, following tonight's lecture, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. And at the conclusion of the time for question and answers, Doug Coltman, our program director of the Paul Henry Institute, 
will make a few brief remarks about the newly completed volume, Serving the Claims of Justice, the Thoughts of Paul B. Henry, which we're pleased to unveil this evening. And then following Professor Copeland's remarks, you are all invited to attend the reception in Paul Hilligan's honor that will be held in the lower lobby of the Gazan Auditorium. That is, once you walk outside, you need to go down a series of steps to uh, get to the lower lobby. I've not been fortunate enough to work side by side with Paul Hilligans, but I thought that uh, it would be a personal pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, and I've known him only by reputation and through brief personal exchanges. But while I have not worked with him, I thought that it would be only appropriate to have someone who has worked with him, uh, who knows him well and has uh, testify to his ability and to his character uh, to provide his introduction. And so I've asked former state representative Bill Bile if he would uh, provide the introduction tonight. Bill? Thank you, Carwin. It is indeed an honor to be here tonight and to, do, and to introduce to you my former speaker, Paul Hilligan. Um, Paul has a rather lengthy and impressive resume, which I will only read a few brief parts of. Um, he is currently the director, the executive director or president of the Detroit Renaissance, which is a nonprofit civic organization, um, a coalition of Southeast Michigan's business leaders to do economic development and public policy issues in the Southeast part of the state. He is a graduate of the University of Michigan and Thomas Cooley Law School. He served for 18 years as a representative in the Michigan House for the citizens of Allegan County in the 88th District. In 1986, he was elected as Republican leader, serving until he was elected as co-speaker of the House in 1993 and served as Speaker of the House from 1995 to 96. He has achieved a significant number of awards recognition both professionally and personally. He's a member of several boards and universities. But in order to get the full measure of Paul Hilligan, you have to understand a little bit about the history and context of the Michigan House in the 70s and 80s. The legislature was firmly in the hands of the Democratic Party and the interests of organized labor in the city of Detroit were preeminent. The leadership was often heavy handed. The margin in the House, for example, was 70 Democrats and 40 Republicans. In 1986, Paul Hilligans was elected by his caucus as Republican leader. And by 1992, his party had captured an additional 55, 15 seats to create a 55-55 tie and bring them into parity for leadership in the Michigan House of Representatives. Now, this is an arena which has been described charitably as smash mouth politics. And Paul accomplished this feat by focusing on issues over ideology and policy over politics. Upon achieving both co-speaker and ultimately as speaker, he set an example of fair, patient, even-handed leadership that was often dramatically contrasted by his predecessors. He conveyed his love for the institution of the Michigan House. He earned the respect of his colleagues, both Democrat and Republican. He showed his true love for the citizens of the state of Michigan. It's no accident that the four years that he served in leadership were among the most productive in the Michigan House. In my pantheon of political heroes, there are very few people who will be on the highest plane, but my friend, my colleague, and, Paul, and my former speaker, Paul Hillegas, will be there. introduction from a great friend, and that makes it special. Corwin, thank you for extending the invitation to me on behalf of the Paul Henry Institute. Um, Corwin uh, was kind enough to uh, not say this evening that his first choice was Speaker of the House, Dennis Haster, um, <laughs> and unfortunately, the Speaker cannot be here, so uh, I'm not just a lame duck, I'm a dead duck, <laughs> filling in. 
for the real speaker, but I didn't hesitate in answering the call uh, to be here tonight um, because, and, and I'll talk about Paul, because Paul has been such a special person in my life as well as the lives of many of you here this evening. Um, but Paul was part of a team, and um, I work still with Karen Henry Stokes. We served together on the Grand Valley State University Board. Um, and in a real sense, the, the spirit of Paul Henry uh, is carried on in, in Karen's work in the community. And, and Karen, it's just a pleasure to be here to remember Paul tonight. Um, I also want to recognize my own wife, Nancy, um, who um, joined me this evening. Nancy, where are you? Um, Nancy. Nancy. <laughs> Thank you for uh, coming over with me this evening. Um, I, I'm going to uh, get into uh, trouble naming the names of friends here this evening, but, but let me just say to President Biker, whose father, Senator Gary Biker, um, was an example and a mentor uh, to me in the early years in the, in the House, um, to my friend and colleague, who you heard from tonight, Bill Bile, and to Judge Rick Banstra, who in that very wonderful uh, couple of years of shared leadership served as the Republican majority leader and, and uh, was um, and, and the uh, majority floor leader um, was my partner uh, throughout all of our uh, difficult times. And, and while I'm going to be talking a lot about Paul this evening, um, what I have to say about politics um, is very much about colleagues like Gary Biker and Bill Bile and Rick Banstra and, and so many others um, who have been called to public service um, in our state and, and federal governments. When John F. Kennedy challenged Americans in so many words to ask not what can government do for us, but rather what can we do for our country, he inspired in millions of young people the vision of politics as a calling to serve. Paul Henry first answered that call by joining the Peace Corps. A young man from Holland, Michigan, Jim Dressel, sought a seat on the Ottawa County Board of Commissioners. And about the same time, I joined the Washington staff of the United States Congressman, Bill Rupi. Our paths converged in 1978, when each of us decided to seek election to the Michigan House of Representatives. Young, energetic Republicans from West Michigan, we immediately became good friends and were referred to by some legislative staffers as the Three Musketeers from West Michigan. Um, I, as an aside, must say that of the three of us, my election to the House in 1978 was probably the least deserved. Um, I uh, had fears that I would be recognized as a carpetbagger because I had been away 12 years from my hometown of Holland. Um, four at the University of Michigan, and then eight in Washington, D.C. And so it was with some reservation um, when then chair of the Ottawa County Republicans, Jim Dressel, called and said, you know, there's a seat being opened up. Um, will, will you uh, consider uh, coming back and running? My immediate response was, no one will know me, and I'll be viewed as a stranger who doesn't belong here. Well, he did encourage me to come back, and the advice I received from friends was, even though you've been away for a while, uh, your family has lived here a good long time. Your dad is still the chaplain of Hope College. So the name is known at least by some. And give it a try. Um, we'd like to see you run. I knew the advice was good when, during that first campaign in the summertime, and I was knocking on all the doors in the district, I came to the door of a young woman who looked to be about my age, and in fact, she was a former high school classmate of mine. I recognized her, but couldn't remember her name. And so I stuck out my hand and introduced myself as Paul Hilligan's candidate for state representative. Her face lit up, and she said, you know, I know your name because I went to school with your son. <laughs> and that was my, my way, I guess, of, of uh, getting involved. 
involved in elective politics. Um, there were a lot of interesting experiences in that first campaign. In fact, several times uh, during that August primary uh, season, skeptical voters would ask me, are you a Christian? And when I answered yes, somewhat uncomfortably, I confess, the next question would be something along the lines, if you really are, why do you want to become involved with those thieves in Lansing? In fact, faith-based convictions mean little if they are not woven into the fabric of our everyday lives. What we decide and how we act. And what we decide and how we, how we act often involves politics. I describe politics as a process that occurs whenever two or more people are trying to transform conflicting ideas into a consensus. And if you think about that definition, in the family, at work, school, and at play, even at our places of worship, we engage in the political process. Um, and one of the other questions I received along the way in that campaign was, uh, you know, why are you going into politics? Why don't you go into uh, the uh, uh, clergy, uh, the, the uh, service of a clergyman uh, like your dad? And I would jokingly say, um, there are too many politics in the church. Um, <laughs> Now I'm on the uh, session of our local church, and I'm not laughing anymore. Um, Paul Henry understood uh, the role of, of Christians in politics very well. For him, the question was not whether faith-centered people should become involved in politics. As a devout Christian, he felt called to be involved, and he struggled constantly with how he best could fulfill that calling. As a policymaker, he cared deeply about achieving a just consensus in a political environment that by its very nature is more gray than black and white. A great American statesman and unsuccessful candidate for the presidency, Adlai Stevenson, once observed, and I quote, after lots of people who go into politics have been in it, for a while, they find that to stay in politics, they have to make all sorts of compromises to satisfy their supporters, and that it becomes awfully important for them to keep their jobs because they have nowhere else to go. Adlai Stevenson was not describing Paul Henry. For Paul, partisan politics and winning elections were really organizational means of achieving public policy goals and not ends unto themselves. He was competitive, for sure, and wanted to succeed, but not at any cost. Respecting his colleagues and constituents, respecting himself, and respecting the political process, Paul believed that to uphold civility, integrity, and yes, justice in social discourse was more important than always winning. His approach would sometimes get him into trouble with political leaders, friends, and constituents. In Paul's first couple of terms in the state legislature, he took unpopular stance for an income tax increase, environmental protection legislation, and even aid to the city of Detroit. Later in Congress, he differed with his party at home and in Washington by speaking out against such things as deployment of a proposed new missile system. USA to anti-communist rebels in Nicaragua, and he championed what at the time was a very controversial national bottle deposit law. I could go on, but Paul didn't always pick the easy issues to differ with constituents on. And it was Paul Henry's strong commitment to social justice that led him to focus his legislative efforts on issues concerning the treatment of those least respected among us. You can tell a lot about a person's faith and values by the issues he or she uh, chooses to focus on. And in fact, not many legislators I knew welcomed the opportunity to serve on the Corrections Committee, which had oversight over our state prisons, as Paul did in both the Michigan House and Senate. I finally recall the October evening when I accompanied him to a small church 
that was located in my legislative district and also located in the shadow of a very unpopular state prison facility. That evening, Paul spoke with passion about the spiritual and educational needs of imprisoned inmates, about the important mission of Chuck Colson's prison fellowship ministry, and the need for those church members in my district to offer their time and Christian love to neighbors incarcerated in that prison down the road. Though Paul Henry dedicated his life to servant leadership, he did struggle with the rest of us, his colleagues, on matters of ego and ambition and when to compromise or stand on conviction. Yet, in a wonderfully joyful way, and Paul was a joyful person, he possessed the ability, courage, and spiritual faith to reach across lines of party, geography, and philosophy, to encourage us to put aside our differences in pursuit of the common public good. I shall never forget the time that Paul was asked to open a legislative session with a traditional invocation. It had been a rancorous period in the State House, with Republicans and Democrats deeply divided over a controversial issue. The session that day promised to be no different. Paul stepped to the rostrum, asked us to bow our heads, and shared a prayer that essentially said, God our Father, we know that you are not a Democrat, but help us to remind some of us that you are not a Republican either. <laughs> Give us guidance and bring us together to do what is right and just for the people of our state. That prayer was the essence of Paul Henry's servant leadership. Leadership that is sorely needed today from my generation and from the generation that students here this evening represent. How does Paul Henry's service speak to us today? Allow me to suggest just a few ways this evening. First, by the issues that most concern Paul. Issues like economic justice and the growing opportunity gap. Paul served on the Education Committee in Washington because he cared so deeply about education and the growing gap uh, that was occurring in our society. And today, we are at more, more at risk of becoming a, a polarized society where unequal opportunity and a history of racial and ethnic distrust feed each other, resulting in a nation of haves and haves not and the loss of community civility. Today, Nancy and I and our two children live in metropolitan Detroit. According to the most recent census, the most racially segregated region in the country. At last count, and these are 1990 numbers, it's worse today, I'm sure. The median income in Oakland County, Detroit's suburban neighbor, was over $51,000 compared to $21,000 in the city. The family income of two-thirds of the students in the Detroit public schools falls below the poverty line. The school dropout rate in Detroit is more than three times higher than the surrounding suburban rate. Detroit is not an isolated case. Again, using 1990 figures, the Grand Rapids metropolitan area boasts one of the highest median family incomes and lowest poverty rates among the 320 metro areas measured across the United States. But since 1950, more than 22 Grand Rapids area census tracts have become poverty neighborhoods where more than 20% of the residents have incomes below the poverty line. Like Detroit, neighborhoods in Metro Grand Rapids are increasingly segregated by race and ethnicity, as well as by income. Perhaps some of you saw the article today in the New York Times, which reported that according to 2000 census uh, figures, non-Hispanic whites are now a minority population living in the 100 largest urban areas. And in a majority of those cities, the overall white population has declined over the past 10 years, while the concentration of poverty 
in our cities has increased. The opportunity gap will not be solved solely by government action. I happen to believe um, that, that President Bush's faith-based initiative is a very important component of dealing with issues like the gap between rich and poor. But at the same time, neither can that issue be solved completely outside of the political process. In their book, Divided by Faith, researchers Michael Emerson and Christian Smith conclude that while the white evangelical church has devoted considerable time and energy to resolving the problem of our nation's racial divisions, it likely has done more to perpetuate than reduce our racialized society. Their study of attitudes held by white evangelicals shows a tendency to minimize our society's race problem. To, extent, to the extent a problem exists, those surveyed view the racial divide as an issue to be addressed by individual relationships and by a change in the black work ethic and other values if more African Americans are going to take advantage of opportunity in a capitalist society. Another well-known evangelical sojourner's editor and activist, Jim Wallace, concurs that conservative Christians too often dwell exclusively in the dogma of personal responsibility. However, he adds that on the other hand, liberal religion has lost its spiritual center, relying on secular social action that is divorced from the power of transformation rooted in faith. In his book, The Soul of Politics, Wallace calls for a prophetic movement manifested by political involvement and grounded in both social justice and personal responsibility. I could not agree more. How faith-centered citizens participate in ongoing public policy debates over such issues as the redistribution of wealth by taxing and spending, educational opportunity for all, and affirmative action to redress a national history of systemic discrimination will shape the future of our state and nation whose population 50 years from now will likely be more brown and black than white. One of the challenges of being in politics is dealing with the how of, of these issues I've cited. And as an aside, let me just say, as important as I believe government policy is in bringing about positive change, we also have to be wary of well-intended public policies that, in fact, do not always achieve the desired result. As I work now in Detroit um, and read the history um, that has brought us to the place we are uh, today in Detroit, I've noted with interest that it has been federal policies, such as post-World War II housing policy, which subsidized new housing in the suburbs, but did not subsidize the rehabilitation of housing in the city, or the building of an interstate highway system that went directly through some of the most prosperous African American neighborhoods in the city of Detroit, or um, in the early 1970s, with the best of intentions, the prospect of court-ordered desegregation, where students would be bused across city lines, that in fact sped, all three of those policies, sped the departure of citizens from the city of Detroit, and also sped uh, the uh, city to the point of, of concentration of poverty that we see today. Um, these ideas have consequences in how we choose to solve some of these issues through public policy is extraordinarily important. Or consider the issue of environmental stewardship. In Michigan, the population is projected to grow by nearly 12%, or 1.1 million residents, by the year 2020. However, if current state land use trends continue, the next 1.1 million people over the next 20 years, will use as much open space as was developed to accommodate the almost 10 million residents um, that we have in the state today. 
Former Governor William Milliken is fond of noting that the 37 million acres that is Michigan is all of the Michigan we have to care for. It is our great responsibility to nurture our state's majestic shoreline, the quiet rivers, streams, and inland lakes, magnificent forests and fields, and yes, the busy streets where people live. Carrying out this responsibility cannot only be a personal commitment to balance our consumption of things with the need to conserve our natural bounty. It is also a question of community stewardship. Paul Henry understood this so well. It's a question of the political will to manage growth in ways that sustain our air, water, and all of creation. Let me pose this issue another way. If we as a nation do not systematically reduce our consumption and the rest of the world continues to strive for the same standard of living we enjoy, will our planet be able to provide for all that the human race demands? The alternatives to the individual practice and community policy of stewardship are more third world poverty, war, and the desecration of God's temple, Earth. Or there is the values debate that Paul agonized so greatly over. And it's a debate that today divides our nation over issues like abortion and gun control, and tomorrow over an issue like genetic engineering. Permit me to use abortion as an example. It is my conviction, as it was Paul's conviction, that God-given life begins at conception. I believe that in matters such as abortion, capital punishment, and euthanasia, our society's laws should uphold the right to life. But think about it. If like-minded citizens ever realize total success in electing a pro-life president, Congress, and a sufficient number of state lawmakers, and if those elected leaders then enacted a constitutional amendment banning abortion outright, would the killing of unborn children stop? I'm not sure, in fact, I don't think so. Because we are a society in which the popular culture, through the personal consumption of music, television, movies, and other media, glorifies violence, cheapens sex, and devalues life itself. Here again, we must be committed to both systemic social justice and personal responsibility. I honestly believe that in this culture, the values that Nancy, Nancy and I are trying to impart to our two young children are as important to affirming the gift of life as any anti-abortion vote I ever cast at the state capitol. What goes on at the state capitol is extraordinarily important and requires our engagement as Christians or other faith-centered individuals. But servanthood and change must also be matters of the heart and soul with how we treat and teach each other. Paul Henry's service also speaks to us about the importance of caring for the political process by which we make community decisions. After serving in the State House, I now work far away from the hustle and bustle of state government and partisan politics. And our family lives in a neighborhood where children's homework School plays, and especially soccer games, are far more important than news from our state and national capitals. Many of my tuned out of politics friends and neighbors have asked me why anyone would want to become involved in such a negative, rotten process. And they roll their eyes when I respond that most of the women and men I have known in the legislature and in politics in general are good and decent public servants. A recently issued study by the Pew Partnership for Civic Change confirms what I have experienced personally. The foundation survey found that few Americans today look to government institutions to solve the societal problems they identify. In fact, the federal government ranked 14th of 15 possible problem-solving agents in our communities. Why this skepticism? In part, I believe it's because of the growing temptation for campaigns and legislative agendas to exploit so transparently 
the issues that arouse our passions and divide us, rather than to focus on sometimes far more complex questions that require difficult answers of inconvenience and even sacrifice on our part as citizens. Our country's political party system, a system whose influence today is based much less on the traditional patronage appointments and jobs than on soft money and independent advertising, is, I believe, a major contributor to today's politics of passion and reaction. And I happen to believe in a strong two-party system. At their best, political parties give voters fundamental choices about the size, scope, and direction of our government. They are a means for people to become directly involved in the exercise of our political freedom. And in most legislative bodies, they are the basis by which elected representatives organize themselves for the purpose of setting agendas and working toward consensus. By these standards, however, our two major parties are not operating very well today. Party platform planks defining fundamental policy choices are often shelved before the ink is dry while the media teams go to work scripting advertising and sound bites that fit the findings of focus groups and opinion surveys. And while the parties trade press releases blaming each other for what is going along with our society and government, a growing number of citizens perceive little difference between the win-at-all-costs tactics of Republicans, Democrats, and interest group allies that, as an aside, I must note, include today some Christian political action groups. Sowing the seeds of distrust and cynicism toward our legislative institutions, today's political campaigns make it much harder for Republicans and Democrats alike to govern after the election is over. And what is worse, in a growing number of legislative bodies, the campaigns never seem to end, as partisan opportunism and acrimony poison agenda setting and consensus building. Um, I saw some of that uh, feeling firsthand recently when I attended a conference uh, put on by the, the uh, State Legislative Leaders Foundation, a group that, that uh, does continuing education for state legislative majority and minority leaders. And they have been benchmarking um, uh, by survey uh, attitudes and activities of legislative leaders for a number of years. And it's quite startling to see the amount of time that legislative leaders now must spend self-reported on fundraising, candidate recruitment, and speaking around the state, um, uh, encouraging partisan activity as opposed to spending time developing public policy and working on problem solving. Well, again, think about Paul Henry. But I believe the successful majority parties and party members in the 21st century will be those who are stewards of their states first, who take seriously their responsibility to care for and invest limited public resources in ways that will build a better statewide community and national community now and in the future, who see, as Paul did, the pursuit of a partisan legislative majority not as an end in itself, but as a means of advancing issues of individual opportunity and social justice, who inspire participation in politics by their vision and principles, and do not exclude those who would participate by single-issue litmus tests. The successful minority parties and leaders in the 21st century will be those who shed their minority mentality, which is the temptation to simply oppose what the majority proposes. And I say this from personal experience. <coughs> I am convinced that one key reason we moved as Republicans from 40 to ultimately a majority was that the Republican caucus members decided to develop a common, proactive policy agenda rather than simply react negatively to majority caucus ideas or push the hot button issues of the month. The result from that kind of task force process, which involved Republicans 
in looking ahead to what are the real problems facing the state and what are some potential solutions. The result of that was constructive engagement in the consensus building process where a minority started to act as a majority and started to make a difference on policy without being a majority. When in 1993, Michigan voters uh, elected 55 Democrats and 55 Republicans to the House of Representatives in Lansing, the legislature agreed with Rick's help and many others to share agenda setting powers and the responsibility for making some very difficult and controversial policy decisions. I can't go into the detail of that exhilarating two years, but I will say it was the most fulfilling two years of the 18 I served. And it's because that from that unusual arrangement where both sides had the opportunity to express their best ideas and work together in resolving differences, that many accomplishments emerged, including a landmark proposal to overhaul the financing of Michigan's public schools and to create more choices for parents by authorizing publicly chartered academies. That was the two years where, for the most part, stewardship and not partisanship prevailed. And I, I have often asked myself, looking back at that two years, how can the lessons learned from that experience, lessons about the power of ideas, about risk-taking and shared problem-solving, be applied in more conventionally organized partisan legislatures. This is the great challenge of civic stewardship confronting today's political parties, elected representatives, and all people, people of faith, who are engaged in partisan politics. And finally, Paul Henry Service speaks to us about personal integrity. The day following the 1992 general election, the Speaker of the House then asked me to stop by his office. Not only had his caucus at the time apparently lost control of the House after more than two decades of majority status, the Speaker himself had been defeated in a hard-fought re-election campaign. And so it was with trepidation that I answered his invitation to stop by his office. Uh, just 24 hours finding out that he had been defeated. Devastated though he was, the speaker wanted to congratulate me, the minority leader, and his assumed successor. He graciously told me that I was about to experience the adventure and burden of a lifetime. The burden I would bear, he said, as speaker, was to maintain the civility and honor of an institution that in a society divided in so many ways, by race, by income, by values, brings together a truly diverse representative group of men and women. Perhaps you visited the state capitol in Lansing. Um, if you've taken the tour, you know that the ground floor rooms of the Michigan state capitol originally served as stables for harnessing the horses that legislators used to travel to the state capitol. Today, those rooms are filled with staffs who have done a good job of harnessing technology. And yet, a legislature's success today depends on what it always has, and that's human relationships. Constructive relationships are built on a foundation of trust and integrity. A lobbyist said it best, I'll never forget it, at my freshman legislative orientation many years ago. Interacting with constituents, colleagues, the news media, lobbyists, every incoming legislator brings to the process the same valuable asset, his or her word of honor. Integrity is an asset that none of us can afford to squander. Today's candidates and office holders feel enormous pressure, believe me, to follow sophisticated analyses of public opinion that can crowd out personal convictions when making difficult, career-threatening decisions. Every serious, well-intentioned candidate for political office I have ever known, myself included, entered his or her campaign to win, and then win re-election. But integrity in politics is not about 
winning and losing. At its best, the political process of representative government fosters the communication of ideas and values between the people and their representatives. At times, those in public office, after listening to public opinion and weighing conflicting information, must follow the dictates of conscience and the soul. Those called to serve must make some unpopular decisions and hope that while constituents may not be in agreement, they will respect and accept their representative's judgment. That was Paul Henry. At the same time, when wrestling with difficult issues of policy and principle, none of us has a monopoly on knowing absolutely what is just or right. We must be open to the gifts God has bestowed on other servant leaders, women and men whose ideas may be as threatening to us as the great prophets' messages were to the political and religious establishments of their time. Government, or whatever political arena in which we are engaged, is a process of accommodation and compromise. It sometimes require us, requires us to accept in good faith a consensus that does not exactly fit our view of how the world should look. Several years ago, the late United States Senator John Stennis of Mississippi was shot during an attempted robbery in front of his Washington, D.C. home. One of the first persons to rush to his bedside was a former Henry uh, lecturer, Senator Mark Hatfield of Oregon. The reported story of their friendship amazed many students of politics, for at that time, Mark Hatfield was a liberal Republican and outspoken critic of the Vietnam War. John Stennis was a conservative Democrat and one of the war's staunchest supporters. And what brought these two men together? It was their religious faith. They met weekly for prayer. And their willingness as servant leaders to work together, agreeing at times, disagreeing at times, and compromising when necessary. Remaining open to God's gifts in others and being true to one's own convictions, do you feel this tension? When should we compromise and when should we make our stand? At college during the Vietnam War years, I gave a great deal of thought and prayer to the idea of becoming a conscientious objector to that conflict. I returned home one weekend to share this heavy burden with my father, knowing that he also had grave misgivings about our country's involvement in Southeast Asia. I fully expected him to reinforce my thinking. Instead, he caused me to ask painful questions about my personal motivations and beliefs. My father did not make a decision for me, and he did not make my decision any easier. But in a loving way, he taught me that there is no simple formula for making moral decisions. <coughs> and this brings me to the third musketeer who entered the legislature with Paul Henry and me. State Representative Jim Dressel loved his work. He was a loyal Republican partisan who understood the importance of bipartisan problem solving. He was proud of his West Michigan roots, but had no use for Detroit bashing. His independent spirit and moderate brand of Republicanism drew a lot of flack. Not all of his constituency appreciated his advocacy for public transit in Detroit, a fuel tax hike to maintain Michigan roads. As a decorated Vietnam War pilot, he had learned to handle that kind of flack. Jim Dressel did his homework, reached well-reasoned conclusions, and seemed comfortable with himself and his constituency. Yet behind his always exuberant, how are you, was a troubled soul. In 1984, he could no longer conceal his personal pain. When Jim announced his intention to sponsor an amendment to the State Civil Rights Act to prohibit discrimination against homosexuals, I could not understand it. Other friends and I warned him it was political suicide. Besides, why should we broaden the definition of civil rights to protect what ought to be a person's private life. Jim told us that he knew citizens who had been denied housing 
and public accommodations, even employment, because they were gay. Who? Where? We asked. He introduced the amendment in an election year, and the, pan and the campaign got very personal. Some said to his face what most whispered behind his back, you must be gay. Forgetting an admirable record of public service, Jim Dressel's constituents soundly rejected his re-election bid. Throughout the controversy, Jim said that his sexuality should be a private matter, apart from the public policy question he had raised. But those two spheres could not be separated. In fact, his amendment was a means by which Jim finally confronted the truth he had concealed from many of us who were his friends. Now, whether homosexuality is a product of one's genes or the environment is still being debated. All I know is that for Jim Dressel, it was a burden he never sought to bear. That burden was made heavier by his religious faith and community upbringing, by constituents who did not want to talk about homosexuality, and by politically active gays who shunned Jim because he would not own up publicly to his sexual orientation. Finally, it was a burden made heavier by AIDS. I had not seen Jim for about one year when one day he stopped by my office to visit. Without telling me he was dying, he had, I realized later, come to say goodbye. After we laughed and talked about many things, a serious moment prompted his observation from him People are rightly concerned about how promiscuity in the gay community has led to the spread of AIDS, he said. Yet at the same time, people make it so difficult for us to enter openly into serious, long-term committed relationships. Jim Dressel was a true public servant. He stood for what he believed was right, even when it was not politically popular. He was not always right. But who among us is? He taught me to be less judgmental about an issue I cannot today fully understand, and more accepting of every one of God's children. Faith in politics, it is manifested in the integrity and courage of individuals like Paul Henry and Jim Dressel. It is revealed in how collectively we engage as citizens political parties, and other interests in community decision-making. The issues we choose to address, the civility and openness we employ to achieve consensus, and the balance we strike between compromise and conviction in our pursuit of social justice. With this in mind, I really don't know how else to end but in prayer. So please join me. Let us pray. God, our Father, how easy it is for us to pray for justice, but how difficult it is for us to agree on what it means to seek justice in our everyday lives. Grant us the strength to struggle with the difficult problems we experience as individuals and as a community. As we become engaged in the process of politics, we humbly ask for your guidance. Help us to be open to your word, not only in scripture and prayer, but in the insights, experiences, and gifts you have bestowed on all of your children. Give us the courage to stand up for what we believe is right, but give us, too, the courage to hear and understand those who have different ideas and answers and who also seek justice in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Thanks very much.
make sure that this uh, doesn't uh, go too long, because I know that uh, some of you may be uh, planning uh, other events, but uh, uh, we do want to have the opportunity to raise some questions uh, in response to uh, Paul's address. So any questions? I see any hands? Go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to answer that question. Do I, did I ever answer the question, do I have an opinion on term limits? Yes, I do. Um, I opposed term limits um, when they were first proposed um, as, as a part of our Constitution. In Michigan, of course, the term limits are for six years in the State House, three two-year terms. And then you can go on to serve uh, two four-year terms in the State Senate. Uh, but those are lifetime limits, so you cannot return after you've served those uh, uh, six and uh, eight-year periods. Um, the conventional arguments against term limits are that uh, the legislature as an institution, which truly is, I, in my humble opinion, the most representative body, it, it does bring together diversity in ways that it's difficult for the courts and the executive branch to uh, uh, bring together. Um, it does weaken the legislature. Um, it strengthens, I think, the executive branch um, and, and the, the lobby uh, court in Lansing. But what I have come to um, appreciate and, and uh, what saddens me most about term limits um, is the impact on the personal relationships that I alluded to in my talk. Um, the reality is that six years is not enough time for people of different races, different ages, different corners of the state to really get to know each other well and to experience the efforts of problem solving um, uh, that, that occurs over a longer period of time. And, and when those relationships suffer, um, the consensus building process around the state suffers greatly. Uh, it is also a huge problem for the leadership of the legislature. Um, we were talking at dinner tonight, but the new chair of the House Appropriations Committee has never served on the Appropriations Committee before and has two years' experience. And he will be gone in three and a half years. Um, that, that is a tremendously difficult thing to ask of a, a committee chair or a House leader. Um, most leaders in any, in any sphere of influence have time to try to, to develop a vision based on experience and to execute um, a plan to achieve that vision. Um, virtually in Lansing today, especially in the House, as soon as you are selected leader, you are pretty much designated a lame duck and the jockeying goes on to replace you. Um, it, it's enormously difficult. Um, to cultivate leadership in that process and to, and to cultivate the personal relationships that I think are so important to problem solving. Um, because of the kind of cynicism about our government, which government in part has brought upon itself, um, but it is also uh, cynicism due to people becoming disengaged from the political process, I don't foresee our term limits changing for a while. You know, when I, when I ask those friends and neighbors um, about term limits, um, the response is pretty much, so what? What's the difference? Um, the best answer uh, to the problems we see in our political system today, whether it's campaign finance reform, um, frustration that people stay too long, the best answer is engagement in the process. I, I firmly believe that if more people decided to express their frustration by simply voting and communicating with legislators, we would have a much different outcome um, from the process than we have today. Um, and, and we are the main problem as citizens. The minority um, votes today, the majority sits home. There are two recent books, I believe, by a Yale University law professor, one called The Culture of Disbelief, and one by Dissent to the Governed, where uh, he talks about and documents how religion is devalued and diminished in society and government. Have you found that a significant role or a significant place in your experience that faith is devalued, religion is deprecated or whatnot as far as public policy? Well, we, we, um, we are an increasingly secular nation. And, and I think the popular media, um, uh, unfortunately, does devalue um, 
the role of religion in society uh, today. And we saw that in this last election. I, I, you know, if you look at a, at a, a presidential map of, of who voted for whom, it's quite frightening to see the, uh, the, not only the geographic polarization, but when you get into surveys to, to see the polarization between people of faith and, and uh, uh, those who, who are very secular and, and view the uh, political process as such. Um, interestingly, the, uh, the uh, Pew Civic uh, Trust that I cited, which ranked the federal government's 14th, I, I will use this opportunity to note that they found um, in their survey work that those citizens who felt most engaged and empowered in the community in one way or another happened to be faith-based, that the church was an important means of uh, engaging people in the community. Um, having said that, what I have tried to convey tonight is that there are different ways people of faith can be involved in our political process, and I think make an especially uh, large difference. Um, Paul Henry's faith was very deep, he was very devout, but I, I think he observed from the New Testament that, that Jesus' inclination was not to establish a political party or a mega temple. Um, that Jesus certainly addressed some systemic issues around him. Um, and it wasn't simply a personal uh, ministry. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been disciples. Um, there was a system. Um, but it was largely Paul's behavior in the process and the issues he chose to get involved with that, that spoke to his faith. Um, at the same time Paul was becoming a leader in state and federal government, the, the uh, organization of religion through Christian political action committees, first the moral majority and, and various uh, derivations of that since, um, took root. Um, but, you know, my observation about that is that's not the most effective way for people of faith to be involved. I think in a very real sense, those kinds of movements have become somewhat secularized in, in, in what is a very uh, secular kind of a political uh, process today, um, driven by money and driven by, by uh, uh, survey research. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm troubled by the, the uh, value divide in our society. I absolutely believe it's, it's vitally important that people of faith become engaged in the process. The, the challenge is how are we going to become involved as people of faith? And I think Paul Henry certainly is a terrific model for that. Thank you, sir, for a very splendid uh, address. Uh, I think uplifting and uh, and inspiring, even. And I'm sure many of us resonate with this and uh, and are uh, are in agreement. Thank you. Your you don't have to be in agreement, though. That's okay. no, no, I, as, as, as the Christians are of faith being more effective in this area, yes, as individuals and even in, in parties and all that, but. How about the church itself as an institution? You know, we have a notion, common notion around here that the church as an institution should not get involved in social and political things. That's left to so-called societies or Christian Christian groups. And I personally don't agree with that at all. I wonder, how do you feel about the church as an institution preaching, teaching, and advocating in social and political issues? As um, a I, church, as yeah, institutional church. We, uh, I'll speak personally, um, we live in a, in a residential area that is very comfortable um, outside of, right outside of Detroit. Um, and it's amazing to me, I, I taught a, a midweek uh, junior high school Bible study class and uh, during the week of Martin Luther King's birthday it was amazing to me that no one in the class had been to Detroit. Um, uh, and, and, and no one uh, knew much about Martin, Martin Luther King's uh, history as it related to Detroit. Um, you know, I, I react to that sort of thing is the church must be more involved in, in issues of social justice. We can't just ignore what's going on in our neighboring communities um, as, or certainly around the world. Um, but even in our neighboring communities, every one of us um, lives where there are challenges. Um, if we live anywhere near a metropolitan area, is living increasingly with challenges of concentration of poverty and issues of justice. 
Um, every one of us lives in an area that is uh, uh, experiencing sprawl in the use of our land, and, and our, our, uh, our decision as individuals and as communities on environmental issues is extraordinarily important. And I think the church has a role in speaking to that, it should have a role. Where I get uncomfortable is, is frankly, the, the kind of uh, super organization that I see, for example, in Detroit right now, um, as we uh, get into a, a mayoral race, um, where the uh, incumbent has, has, has announced he's leaving office and we have challengers who are among the most influential uh, power brokers in the city of Detroit in that mayor's race? The pastors in the churches downtown. And that can become, frankly, a very corrupting influence on churches. I mean, there, you, you, need to, you need to be involved in issues of social justice, but when churches start acting or even replacing uh, political parties, um, I get very nervous. And, and so, um, it, it, again, it's a question of how institutions, much as, much as it is a question of how we as individuals become involved, it's true of institutions too. Two more questions. We'll get to now. Paul, on, on the issue of land use and, and manage, managing growth and use of resources, where has your faith led you in balancing stewardship <coughs> of land and resources with uh, a person's desires for more land and that kind of a lifestyle? Where does that lead you as far as work you know, the government should be involved in that? Um, it has, well, first of all, in a real sense, I, I think it was it was part of a calling I felt after the legislature to go to Detroit because I, I really do believe that um, we will not successfully change people's behavior um, in terms of building out and uh, seeing more and more sprawl without addressing some of the issues within our urban and older suburban areas that have to do with making communities more livable. And at the top of the list is the condition of, of education. Um, I have, frankly, become radicalized on the issue of education to the point um, where I think that at least in, in areas where districts are clearly failing, um, public districts, that we ought to be able to have vouchers for parents. Um, and, and I know the argument is, well, that leads to the destruction of public school districts. What, what do you say to those parents whose children have no hope of seeing reform in their lifetimes? Um, in the city of Detroit, the Detroit Detroit has lost population in the 10 years, um, and it has lost more and more middle-income families. The Detroit School District has lost in the last four years 20,000 students. Um, and that is about a city unable to retain people because kids don't have a decent chance for education. Um, having said that, I, a lot of the problems on how education is delivered in some of our core urban areas and how city services are delivered have to be fixed by the cities themselves, and this is a Republican in me, um, but, but government and, and uh, public education could be much more efficient and effective than I see it being in a community like Detroit. But I will also, now I'm going to sound like I've become radicalized in another way. The reality is that as much as we talk about our cities having to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and do things better, if we as a society do not choose to do more tax-based sharing, in other words, redistributing some of the wealth um, that has accumulated in our country, in rebuilding infrastructure and making possible uh, more intensive education where families have fallen apart, things like after school and summer school programs, our cities will never um, reverse the trend that they're experiencing and, and our country will become more polarized. This is not just about efficiency and effectiveness, it is about the issue of justice when it comes to distributing public dollars. And my one thing I have, have observed from the outside is that we've seen government swing from liberal, thinking that, that government could fix all these problems, to conservative, um, saying government shouldn't be so involved. And you know the common bond, though, between the two wings, the conservative and liberal, is that the temptation is by um, the federal government in Lansing to try and micromanage how change is made um, in our local communities. And, and, and social engineering usually doesn't work very well. What government can do, though, frankly, is to redistribute some wealth 
and and while I think faith-based initiatives are an important aspect of fixing um, problems um, in our society, they should be an important aspect with or without government uh, uh, sponsorship uh, or funding. Um, I, as I say, I, I happen to be intrigued by, by what President Bush is, is proposing, um, but, but that shouldn't be the sole answer. Um, one of the answers has to be, are we going to use government to, to reallocate public resources in ways that help to close the gap that is growing in this country between rich and poor um, without doing too, much, too many strings attached or social engineering um, with that money? Um, now, you asked me about land use, but if you look at the trends today in Michigan and elsewhere, um, they're very much the same, that it's not only the cities that are losing more and more population or losing more middle income population, it's now the older suburbs. And, and this is very much, I think, about solving problems in, in the suburbs and the cities uh, to slow that push out. One, one last question, then we'll ask Professor Coleman. I was pleased, as Dr. Decker was, with your analysis as well. Uh, to follow up to what you've been saying, there were 1,500,000 whites in Detroit in 1950. There's a little over 100,000 now. Uh, we have in Georgetown Township, which you're aware of, 97% uh, whites. Uh, what can we do in terms of state policy, and particularly those churches you cited in Detroit, to try to turn this around? The 50 to 60,000 abandoned houses in light of your environmental concern. Um, it's again, it's a combination of some things that the city has to do to fix services. And you know, to be sure, one of the great frustrations I have working with Detroit Renaissance today is that there is more investment interest um, by people who want to rebuild housing in the city, start businesses in the city, than there is the capacity of city government to assemble property tear down uh, abandoned, uh, unsafe buildings and prepare the way for that investment. Um, so some of this has to be fixed by the, uh, the city and supporters itself. Um, I, if, if you could uh, make the investment climate better, um, the tendency I've noted is that, that still most of the interest is in, in, uh, in building places where people will visit and be entertained in and not where people will live except, interestingly, in Detroit and other core cities when it comes to uh, uh, locked housing and the kind of housing that attracts um, couples or, or single um, uh, homeowners without kids. The, the key, in my view, is, again, education. And we will not integrate classes, much less races, um, on, on a broad basis until parents can feel good about the schools in which their children are going to be enrolled. And that's why, again, I, I have become radicalized on this issue of what do you need to do to fix education. Um, I don't think, frankly, um, that, that public education can fix itself uh, without some alternatives to push it. Um, a stronger private school system and uh, uh, more publicly chartered academies in, in uh, Detroit to the to the point where there's enough critical mass that the public schools decide that there are some things that can be done internally to adopt that kind of model of more building-based learning, where parents do have a lot more ability to affect change within that building. Um, these things can be done, um, but it, it, is, it is a real commitment, both monetarily and policy-wise, to how we educate our kids. Um, you know, I, I don't mean to minimize things like crime and safety in our urban areas, but that's as important too. But you know, those things with, with priorities being set can be fixed um, and will be fixed if, if uh, parents uh, choose to uh, stay in a, in a community or return to a community where they want to educate their kids. Believe me, the, uh, in the healthy neighborhoods in Detroit, police service is made available because parents insist on it. Thanks very much. Oh. Oh, that's right. We'll, uh, we're going to have Doug come and okay. then we'll give you a final thing. Um, about a year ago, or a little more than a year ago, actually, Corwin Smith and I 
And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be good to put together a book of uh, some of the things Paul Henry wrote? And uh, we went for funding, actually, for the Calvin Center for Christian Scholarship. But the Henry Institute put some funds together. And uh, we started work on Paul Henry's archives at our Calvin College and some of the books that Paul uh, loaned uh, and Paul's estate, Karen, especially gave to us uh, after Paul's death. And sifted through those things, and actually, I have to give credit to Ryan Hunt, my student assistant, who actually did most of the work of sifting through this stuff. Um, and then uh, we, uh, Ryan and I, and Cora, we sort of came up with a list of Paul's writings, and then I read it, and, and I really loved it. But I, my wife looked at it and said, "This is uh, it's pretty thick. Can we uh, add some stuff to it?" And so we asked ten people from across the country and who knew Paul Henry at different stages to write essays about Paul. And, some of those essays are really uh, funny. I won't tell any of them to you because then you might not buy the book. <laughs> uh, and also to spice it up, uh, we poured through some of Paul's, Henry's constituent letters that he wrote to constituents about certain issues that he dealt with, mostly while he was in, in the US Congress, but also uh, the crime issue while he was in the state legislature serving with, with Paul Hillegans. And all that has been compiled and put together. And, and uh, we just received back from the printer a book Serving the Claims of Justice, the Thoughts of Paul B. Henry. It's published, again, by the, the Henry Institute, and all profits go to the Paul Henry Institute, not to me. Uh, but we are unveiling it and offering it for, for sale uh, tonight. It's a $14.95 or $15 uh, for this book. And the title was chosen, uh, I guess, very consciously. And I was going to explain it, but actually, Paul, you explained it very well at the end of his talk that that people of goodwill, whether they're Christian or other religious faith or no particular religious faith at all, um, can all strive for justice in the public order. And uh, I think Paul Henry tried to do that, and, and Paul Hillegans and many others that, that uh, Paul mentioned here tonight did that. But those claims are unclear and ambiguous, that as we represent a particular area, a particular constituency, have a particular worldview, that my claim of justice is different than your claim. And also, as a representative uh, that Paul Henry was in most of his public life, that um, you are obligated, in some sense, to, to serve the claims or advance the claims of the people you represent. And if they're not a part of your core belief, you might have to set aside your own opinion to really fully represent uh, the views of, your, of uh, the people who have elected you. And so it's a struggle of, of a Christian of, of integrity in the public Ser, uh, sphere to serve the many claims of justice and try to seek out of that pro the political process uh, some advancement of the kingdom or at least some preservation that we have of the kingdom of God. And uh, I think Paul Milligan said that better than I just did. Uh, but that's the reason for the title of Serving the Claims of Justice, which Paul Henry goes back to uh, several times in his writings. So we're very pleased as, as the Henry Institute to unveil the book tonight and to offer it to you uh, as the first group who uh, were able to purchase it. Thank you. Now, would you please join with me in thanking Paul Elegans for his excellent talk. And also, uh, once again, please uh, note that you're invited to the reception afterwards. Uh, it will be downstairs, and we trust that you will uh, meet some friends and uh, perhaps uh, meet some new acquaintances. Thank you.